Amen, amen. Let's just give it up for Battle Drums. That was incredible. Let's hear it. That's good. Hey, so what's going on, Spectrum? Welcome to week two of 2021. I just want to let you know I am so glad that you are here tonight, whether you are joining us again in person, we got some of our family joining us online. I just want to let you know I am so glad that you are here again. We are a family. And can we just make some noise for those of us here who, you know, this is your first time. Can we just make some noise? That's right. That's right. Let's show a warm spectrum. Welcome. Uh, one thing about spectrum that you need to know is that we will always make room for you. We will always make room. And maybe your friends brought you here tonight. And maybe just like this whole thing, it's a little bit weird. The whole like maybe the Jesus thing, the church thing it still feels a little bit weird to you. I just want to let you know that's okay. And I just want to let you know how welcome you are. And maybe for you, you're just like, you're, you're coming here and it's like, hey, this is kind of weird. We're studying a 2,000-year-old book. We're singing songs to a guy named Jesus. This still feels a little bit weird. I just want to let you know that is okay. Uh, one thing we like to say here at Spectrum is that we, we believe that you can belong here. You can be a part of our family even if you don't believe yet. Amen? Amen. So I don't know what kind of year 2021 has been for you so far. I don't know if it's been a good year, a bad year something in the mix, but I'm going to bet that you have not had a year quite like my friend that I'm going to tell you about. His name is Stefan Thomas. Let me tell you about Stefan Thomas. So Stefan Thomas of San Francisco says he has made peace with forgetting his Bitcoin password that would have turned him into a multimillionaire. Thomas, who recently was featured in the New York Times, has about $220 million dollars worth of Bitcoin locked away on a hard drive that will erase its data after 10 password attempts. So think like when your phone, like when you lock yourself out, think about this, except this dude has $220 million in Bitcoin. Hear this, Thomas has tried to put the correct password eight times with no luck. The German born programmer lost a piece of paper containing the password. This is what he said. You sort of question your self-worth. What kind of person loses something that important? And Thomas said this during a recent interview with ABC News before detailing how he has come to terms with what happened. Thomas said he told his story to help prevent, prevent others from forgetting their passwords. And I guess the moral of the story is, I guess, don't put your password to your $220 million on a piece of paper because this is 2021 and not 2005. We have things to hold your passwords. You don't have to use a piece of paper. Come on. And for real, let's just give a shout out to 2017, which was the last year Bitcoin was actually worth any money. You guys remember 2017? Shout out to Despacito. That's right. So you guys feeling that? Hey, let's sing it. I'm kidding. Please don't. Please don't. Just kidding. So tonight and over the next four weeks or next three weeks, I guess, because I'm bad at math, I'm going to be sharing a series of talks that is going to be our 2021 vision series, our 2021 vision series. And if you've been joining us, uh, you've been a part of our family for, for a while, you'll probably remember that for the last three years, we have had kind of a phrase, we've had a tagline that's kind of described our year. So if you remember back in 2018, it was life to the full. You guys remember that? How many was here for life to the full? You guys remember that? Okay. 2019 was there is room, right? Anyone here in 2019? That's good. That's good. Last year, our tagline was the time is now. And we believe that God gave us that phrase, that, that tagline for each of those years. We believe that those phrases helped define what God was doing and where God was taking our community that year. In each of those taglines, each of those phrases, we still say those, those are still a part of who we are, but, but each of those phrases, I believe, each of those taglines was helping us prepare for where we are now. Over the last three years, I believe that God has been prepping us for exactly where we are now. Each year, each step that we've taken has been preparing us for us moving to West Side, where we're at right now. And again, as you all know, Spectrum is still the same Spectrum that we were when we met on the other side of town, when we met at the Hub. We're still the same Spectrum, but this is what I believe. We're in a new year. Obviously, we're in a new venue. And I believe that with that, God has given us a new purpose. And as we step into this new year, as we step into 2021, I believe it is time for a new vision. Amen? Amen. 
for me. It's time for a new vision. It's time for us as a community, as a Spectrum family, to take our Spectrum family, to take all the things that make us a family outside those doors. Because I believe that 2021 is going to be a year of revival, not just in our city, but in our state and in our nation. And I believe this. Down to the very core of my being, that Spectrum is going to be the one leading the charge into revival. I believe that. But if we want to step into that future, if we expect to experience revival, it is time that we know who we are. It is time that we know who we are. And if we don't know who we are, how on earth can we expect to be able to communicate to others who we are? If we don't know who we are, if we can't communicate that, how are we going to communicate that to our friends that we're trying to invite? And spectrum is not changing. We're not changing. We're the same spectrum. Who we are, what we do is not changing. But I also believe it's time for all of us to get on the same page. Mm -hmm. I believe we need to get on the same page. I believe it is time for all of us to speak with one voice. And with that in mind, I'm very excited to share Spectrum's culture, our vision statement going forward. And this is something that I want each of us to memorize. I want each of us to memorize. I want each of us to apply this in our lives. Not just on Thursdays, not just on Mondays for small groups, but every day. And here's the reason why. When somebody asks who you are, when somebody asks what makes you different, why, are, why do you act different from other people? When somebody asks, hey, why do you go to Spectrum three times, you know, two times a week? Why are you always at church? What's that about? This is what you can tell them. So let's stand up Let's because we're going to learn this. Let's stand up. Everybody stand up. Come on. You don't have PE anymore. That's not an excuse. Come on. Stand up. <laughs> So repeat this after me. We are Spectrum. We, are we stay future focused. We, stay future focused. We, are we are city changers. We always make room. We, make room. we, do, not we do not settle. You can take a seat now. Woo. So this is who we are Spectrum. And none of this, none of this is new. These are all things that we were doing. None of this is new. None of this is something that we weren't already doing before. But if we are going to lead the charge into revival, we all need to have the same marching orders, right? We all need to have the same marching orders. We all need to know where we're going. We all need to be on the same page. We all need to know who we are and what we do. So if somebody asks, hey, what goes down at Spectrum? Why, Why should I come? You can communicate that to them. You can explain that to them. And this is Spectrum's culture. This is our vision statement. And each of you in this room, no matter how long you've been coming to Spectrum or not, you have played a part in making Spectrum who we are today. I don't get to define what Spectrum is. I don't get to define what Spectrum's culture is. You do. That's what you have always been doing. That's what you will continue to do. It's just simply my job to describe who we already are in a way that we can communicate with others, right? I don't, I don't get to determine what our culture, I don't get to determine what makes Spectrum Spectrum. You guys do, and you have for many years, and you're going to continue to do that. But we are here to be something more than just a cool youth group, which we are. Like, right, come on. We're a cool youth group, right? But Jesus has called us to change the world, not to make Spectrum's name famous, but to make his name famous. Jesus' kingdom uh, doesn't need cool youth groups. It needs committed disciples, people who are actually bought in and want to follow Jesus with everything that they have, people who have have realized that they found their place in the bigger story of what God is doing in this world. And our core verse for Spectrum is this. It is 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. So tonight, if you are taking notes, we're going to be looking at that first part of our vision statement, which is we stay future focused. So if you have a Bible with you, please open up to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, near the end of your New Testament. I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation tonight, but... As always, if you do not have a Bible, uh, we're going to have the verses up on the screen for you to follow along with. But Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Let's go. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, 
let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this night. We thank you for bringing all of us together. I believe that every time we open your word that you have something that you want to say. So I pray that we would be in a place that we're ready to receive it, God. I pray that you give us open hearts, open ears to hear what you want to say to us and help us to focus as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the key to growing as a human being, and I'm not even really talking as a disciple of Jesus. I'm just simply talking as a human being. The key to growth is to remain future focused. The key to growth is to remain future focused. To be future focused simply means that you live a life defined by what's ahead of you rather than what's behind you. You live a life defined by what you're going into rather than where you come from. And I don't know what your past is. I don't know what baggage you walked in here carrying. I don't know what secrets you may have. I don't know what your past is. But I do know that your past should not control your future. I know that your past should not control your future. And last week we talked about how your past is powerful, right? We talked about how your past, your story is powerful. But we also talked about how your past needs to stay in the past. Your past needs to stay in the past. And my friends, if you continue to live a life defined by what has happened to you or by what you've done, you will always remain stuck. Jesus did not come to save you from your past so that you could keep living in it. And that's why if we want to live the life that God has designed us to live, we must stay future focused. Because of the good news of Jesus, our past does not have to have control over our future unless we allow it to. Our past does not have to control our future unless we let it. We must stay future focused. And maybe you're asking, what does it mean to be future focused? And I believe that this text gives us three very practical steps on how we can remain future focused. And the first one is this is ready. If you're taking notes, it's ready. Let me reread verse 1 of chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Now, the author of this letter, the author of Hebrews, we don't actually know who that is, compares the life of following Jesus with a race. This person compares the life of following Jesus with a race, and they're not the only one to use that metaphor. The apostle Paul uses that metaphor throughout the New Testament, and this is what he says in, in what many consider to be the last letter that he wrote during his lifetime in 2 Timothy. This is what he says. He says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful, and now the prize awaits me. The crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on the day of his return. One of the most common metaphors, illustrations that the New Testament authors use to describe our life following Jesus is a race. Following Jesus is like running a race. And let's just be real. Running a race is hard. Running is hard. And I know that some of you are going to be like, but well, if you just run long enough, you'll get the runner's high. That, no. <laughs> running is hard. I don't care what you say. Running isn't fun. It's not pleasant. I think the whole runner's high, that's just something you made up to make me run. <laughs> but before we start running, we have to get ready. We have to get ready before we start running. And turn to your neighbor, say this. Say, I got to get ready. Say that one more time. That was loud enough. Say, I got to get ready. If you want, thank you, I heard that. If you want to live a life that is future focused, you have to be ready for the race before you ever set foot at the starting line. You got to get ready for the race before you get to the starting line. I mean, think of it this way. Nobody shows up for a race 
in their like street clothes. Just like, hey, cool, I heard you guys are having a race today. You know, you don't, you're not watching the Olympics. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if we're ever gonna have Olympics again with COVID, but like with the Olympics, you never see the like runners in the Olympics roll up in like their skinny jeans and Air Force Ones, right? No, you have to get ready. You wear clothes that are suited to running. And the author of Hebrews says that we need to strip off every weight that slows us down. Your translation may say it this way, that we need to throw off everything that hinders us. And if you want to get ready for the race, you have to get rid of anything, anything that is going to prevent you from running the way that you need to. You need to get ready by getting rid of anything that is going to hold you back from running that race. And according to the author, what is the thing that is most likely to hold you back? Sin. Sin is most likely to hold you back. We're all sinners, right? We're all imperfect people. We all choose to disobey God at some point. We all make broken decisions, broken choices. And just because you are saved does not mean that you're not still going to sin. Mm. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you're still not going to battle sin. And not only does sin, it steals your potential, but it, it, it poisons your soul, but... Especially in the context of this passage, it also keeps you stuck in the past. Your sin keeps you stuck in the past. And we cannot stay future focused if we live a life defined by sin. Whatever that sin is, we cannot stay future focused if we live a life defined by sin. You cannot lose your salvation by sinning, but sinning can take away your potential. You can't lose your salvation, but sinning will definitely steal your potential. A life that has lived in constant, unrepentant sin in a cycle of sin is going to steal the potential that God has given you. And if you are unwilling to let go of whatever your specific sin is, whatever your specific struggle is, it's going to keep you from running the race that God has put in front of you. It will trip you up. You may be able to run for a little while. You may be able to tell yourself, hey, I'm doing okay. I'm doing fine. I'm, I'm even beating other people. Look, hey, look at that. Like, I'm, I'm running... And I'm beating other people. I'm doing better. But at some point, if you refuse to deal with that sin, it is going to trip you up. At some point, it's going to trip you up. And to be a follower of Jesus doesn't mean that you're never going to sin. To be a follower of Jesus means that you don't live a life defined by sin anymore. The beautiful message of the gospel, the good news, is that Jesus came to this earth so that he could take your sin. He came to this earth so that he could free you from living a life of shame, of sin. And if Jesus has freed you from a life of sin, why would you want to continue living in it? If Jesus has freed you from that sin and given you the ability that you don't have to be defined by that sin anymore, why would you want to continue living that way? Right? So whatever your sin is, whatever the sin that you our weakest to, whatever your struggle is, as you are looking ahead for this race, you need to throw that away. Strip it off. Get rid of it. Whatever that struggle is, whatever that sin is, get rid of it. Because it's only going to hold you back from the race that God has set in front of you. And God has designed this race for you, but if your sin, if you refuse to let go, it's going to hold you back. You will never experience God's best for you. But just like we talked about last week, we don't have to run this race alone. We don't have to cross the Jordan River by ourselves. The author of Hebrews says that we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses. Your translation might say we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. What does that mean? So for some context, the book of Hebrews is written to a, a group of Jewish Christians. These are Jewish people who've chosen to follow Jesus. But here's the thing. Ever since they chose to follow Jesus, life has gotten really hard. At the time that this letter is written, they are experiencing severe, extreme persecution just simply for the fact that they say they follow Jesus. And at this point, they're ready to give in. That's why the author of this book writes it, because they're ready to give in. They're ready to quit. They bought into this idea that, you know what? I like Jesus, but life is really hard. I think I'd rather just go back to the way it was. And how does the author of Hebrews remind and encourage these Jewish believers? He does it by reminding them of the people who've run the race before them. And I'm sure if you've been in church long enough, you've heard of something called the Hall of Faith, which is the chapter just before this one. We're in chapter 12. Chapter 11 is basically a synopsis of the Old Testament. 
looking at like some of just the heroes that we all learned about in Sunday school, if you went to Sunday school. Noah, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, all these people, all these people that we are familiar with, that's what that chapter is about. And, and the author of Hebrews, he's writing to these Jewish people, reminding them, hey, you're heroes of the faith. Do you remember, Mo you remember Moses? Remember how he led the Israelites across the Red Sea? Hey, do you remember David when he, when he stood up to Goliath? All these things, the author is reminding them, reminding them of their heroes, the people that they look up to. And the author says that they are now here to cheer you on, that their story that we have written in this Bible is here for your motivation too. Because it feels good to have a crowd cheer for you, right? That feels good. Can anyone resonate with that? Like it, it feels good to have a, a crowd cheer you on when you're doing something hard. So many, many, many years ago, when I was but a wee lad, um, I decided to have my birthday party at Stone Age Climbing Gym. Has anyone ever been to Stone Age before? Stone Age. So a couple of slight problems. Uh, one, up at that point, I'd never been rock climbing before. Sounded cool, but I'd never done it. Two, bit of an issue. I was and still am extremely terrified of heights. I can't stand them. So I'm climbing, you know, it's my birthday. I'm thinking I'm, I'm, I'm all that. So I'm climbing, get like, you know, two thirds up. And then I look down, it's like, oh, shoot. And I'm really high up. And I realize I'm looking up, it's like, oh, I still have a ways to go. And at my birthday party, I begin to weep. I begin to weep. I tell you, I'm crying. I'm so upset. I'm scared. I am begging. The instructor, just let me down, let me down. I don't, want, I don't want to do this anymore. I hate this. This is the worst. I'm crying and crying, crying at my birthday party. I'm crying, just asking this guy, hey, just let me come down. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm in tears just coming off of my face. It's extremely embarrassing. This is my birthday, by the way. But I'm super upset. I'm like frozen. I'm so scared until everybody in the climbing gym not just the people who are there for my birthday party who are having to watch the guest of honor cry. Everybody in that climbing gym started to cheer me on. Even the people who are like experienced climbers, you know, the people who just like don't need a rope, which terrifies me, but they just like, they'll just go climb like the rock wall with no rope, that's fine. All these experienced climbers who knew what to do, they saw that I was having trouble and they started cheering me on. The whole gym, it was cool and extremely embarrassing at the same moment, but they started to cheer me on. And the fact that I knew that I had an entire gym of people, many of them really good climbers cheering me on, it gave me that little bit of motivation to make it all the way up. No matter how hard the race is that is in front of you, no matter whether you feel like you're ready to run it or not, whether you feel like, you know, I don't know how difficult that sin that you may be struggling with is, you have a crowd of people who are around you to cheer you on. And whether you're discouraged, you can read about Joseph. You can read about Moses. You can read about David. You can read about Paul. That's why God has given us his word. It's to encourage us. We can read stories of when other people have gone before us and they've experienced hardship. And we can see the good things and the bad things they did. But that gives us motivation to keep going. First step is we got to get ready. Second step to stay future focused is set. Ready, set. I'm sure you can figure out where it's going. Spoiler, third point. Let me reread verse 2 of chapter 12. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. And if you are running a race, you have to have a clear idea of where you're going, right? Right? You have to know where you're going in a race. No one just shows up to a race and, and doesn't look ahead. If you do that, if you just stare at your feet the whole time, you just stare at the ground, at some point you're going to run into someone. You're going to run into something else or someone else. To stay future focused isn't to stare at your feet. To remain future focused is, isn't to focus on what other people are doing. Because it's easy to think, hey, I'm running ahead, but I'm looking at them. What are they doing? The way to remain future focused is to fix our eyes, to set our eyes on something constant. Something that's going to give you the motivation to keep going. We don't fix our eyes on our circumstances. We don't keep our eyes on our feet. We also don't look at, look at what other people are doing. We're not here to pay attention to, to what other runners are doing. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the one who, who he designed the race, 
that were on, and then he ran ahead of it first. He ran this race first. That's Jesus. He is the champion who initiates, who, who perfects our faith. He was there at the beginning. He's the one who even gave us the option that we were able to receive him. He was there with us that first day that we wanted, we, we wanted to follow Jesus, and he's going to be there when our race is over. He's there also at the end. He's the author. He's the, he's the initiator. He's the perfecter of our faith. And the race that, that he ran was much harder, much more painful. And yet it says this, that I love it, that because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. Because of the joy awaiting him. None of us have ever had to face that race. None of us have ever had to face a race that looked like that. And yet it says that Jesus was willing to endure all of it because he knew that there was joy waiting for him across that finish line. He knew that there was joy waiting for him across the finish line because of that, because he has gone before us. He should be the one that we are setting our focus on. Not the painful circumstances that, that you might be dealing with. I don't know what you're dealing with right now. But if you want to keep going through this race, focusing on those circumstances is not going to get you through it. Not the race that other people are running. Don't, don't, don't focus on the, the race that other people are running. I like that Christine Kane says this. She says, God only gives you grace for your race. God only gives you grace for your race. Set your focus on Jesus. And when you do that, when you set your focus on him, that's where you get the motivation. And every so often, I like to go shooting, um, you know, shooting at a range or whatever. And if you've ever been shooting, you'll know that basically, if you want to shoot well, you have to aim well, right? If you want to shoot well, you have to aim well. If you're going to hit the bullseye on the target, you have to, you know, aim for the target. You're not going to hit the target if you're aiming over here and the target's there. You have, to, you have to shoot at what you're aiming at, right? And when it comes to our life as Christians, we need to be aiming at a worthy target. We need to aim at a worthy target. Don't aim to be like somebody else who's running their race. Don't, don't aim to be that. It's like, hey, they seem to be doing really good. I'll just, I'll just do what they do. That's not the race that you're on. Jesus has given you your own race. He's given you the power to run your race. He doesn't want you to run someone else's. He wants you to run yours. He designed your race. He, he also ran ahead of you. He ran ahead of you in this race, and he's also promised that he's always going to be with you. And the joy, the joy that motivated Jesus to endure the cross was the joy of offering you salvation. That's the joy. When Jesus was running his race, he was running it for you. When he was allowing himself to be nailed to a cross by his own creation, praying for them as he's doing it, he was thinking of you. He was thinking of you. He was running his race thinking about you. And now as you are running your race, you need to set your focus on him. You need to set your focus on Jesus. We want to say future focus. Step one, ready. Two, set Trees go. That's right. And the band can head on out as well. Let me read the last couple verses of our passage. Think of all the hostility that Jesus endured from sinful people. Then you will become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. Friend, the key to staying future focused is simply to start going. And then once you've started going, the, the, the challenge is to keep going. It's easy to get started, but the challenge is you need to keep going. Life as a follower of Jesus is not easy. It's not easy. When you choose to follow Jesus, you are not choosing to, to live a life that's simple or free from difficulty. If somebody told you that, then they're a liar. The life of following Jesus is not easy. Jesus promised to bring us life to the full. He did not promise us life to the easy. And that's why Jesus himself, when he's describing, hey, do you want to know what it means to be my follower? This is what he says. He says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. Yeah. It's not going to be easy following Jesus. Jesus himself told you that. It's not easy to follow Jesus. Fighting against sin, constantly trying to, to take up your cross, getting rid of the things that are holding you back, that's hard. It's painful at times. 
There's times running that race just like, I want to give up. I hate this. It was easier doing my own thing. I just want to go back to that. It's easy to, to look back and that, remember how easy it was. It hurts sometimes following Jesus. But just because it hurts doesn't mean that it isn't worth it. Yeah. Doesn't mean that it isn't worth it. Spectrum, we stay future focused because we believe that what lies ahead of us is infinitely better than anything we're leaving behind. Amen. The future ahead of us is not easy. Nobody said it was. Jesus told us it wasn't going to be easy. But we still believe that what's ahead of us is better than anything that we are leaving behind. The fact of the matter is the race that we're all running is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. American culture tells us, uh, you know, it, it tells us you can find success overnight. But the life of a faithful follower of Jesus is not an overnight success. The race you've been called to is a marathon, as in it's going to take time. It's going to take endurance to make it to the finish line. And the way that we make it to the finish line is to stay future focused. We have to get ready for this race by throwing away anything that is going to hold us back. When we look at everything that Jesus has done for us, when we know that even though it's not easy, we know that he offers life to the full. We should look at our lives and be like, I don't want anything that's not that. If it's not life to the full, let me get rid of it. It's, gonna hold, it's just going to hold me back. Once you start running, you need to set your eyes on Jesus. You need to set your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith. And then it's time to go. You need to get going. Because Jesus gives us the strength and the motivation to keep going. To keep running, even when it's hard. The gospel keeps us going even when we want to give up. Even when life would be easier if we just gave up, like, like these early followers of Jesus who were ready to throw in the towel. The gospel keeps us going. The same grace that got you onto the racetrack in the first place is the same grace that's going to give you the strength to finish it. The same grace that got you on that racetrack, that got you up to the starting line, is the same grace that's going to help you run. The same Jesus who... who paid for your sin on the cross is the same Jesus who is going to give you the motivation to keep throwing off sin, to keep taking up your cross every day, even when it's hard, even when it hurts. But our only hope is to stay future focused. We have to focus on what's ahead, not what's behind. It's good to know where you come from, like we talked about last week. You should know where you're coming from, but we need to focus on what's ahead of us. We're future focused. And two weeks ago, on the last day of 2020, um, those of you who are here, we, we wrote on, on a board things that we wanted to leave behind in 2020. Pain, struggles, sin, lots of different things. Whatever that was for you, there was something, hey, what, what were you supposed to leave in 2020? That's what you guys wrote here. For some of you, I, I've been looking over it. I see fear, I see, I see struggles with sin. I see pain and, and suffering and just the, the crazy year that 2020 was. I, I see that. I see that written out right there. 2021 is the start of a new future. It's the start of a new future. It's a new year. And it's time for a new vision. We are spectrum and we stay future focused. And because of Jesus, no matter what you wrote on this board, I don't know what you wrote on this board. Whatever that was, whatever struggle that was that you wrote on this board, whether that was a struggle with sin, maybe the fact is that you, you lost a loved one, maybe you lost multiple loved ones, you lost friendships, you lost dreams, maybe there's a struggle with sin that you've been continually fighting against. You've been continually fighting against, you wrote this on that board. And you believe that I don't want to leave, I don't want to take that with me. I don't know what 2021 holds, but I don't want to take that with me. And you know what that was. And even if you weren't here for Spectrum, if, if you weren't here for that, think of that. What, what's something that you wish you would have left in 2020? This is the good news about what it means to be future focused. Is the gospel, no matter what your past is, the gospel wipes it clean. Like no matter what that is, no matter what you wrote on that board. The gospel wipes it clean. That's why we can be future focused. These things don't have to define you. 
I don't know what you wrote on this board. I don't even know if you even wrote anything, but there's something in your past that you feel like defines you. Maybe it's even a sin that you took with you into 2021. Maybe you're hoping to get rid of that pornography addiction, but it just it's still with you. You took it into 2021. Maybe it's that toxic relationship that you know you need to get out of, that you know is abusive, but you just can't. The good news of the gospel is that those things get to stay in 2021, and stay in 2020. Those things aren't coming with you. That's what Jesus does. That's why we can be future focused. Because Jesus has given us a fresh start. So many people, New Year's resolutions, it's all about fresh starts. How can I get a fresh start? Here, I'll go to the gym this time. I'll get in shape this year. We all need a fresh start. Jesus actually gives us one. The whole world is looking for one. I don't know what you took with you, what burden you've been facing. The good news of Jesus is that he enables us to be future focused because he wiped that clean. Whatever that weight was that you've been carrying, he washed it away. You don't have to take that with you anymore. You can throw that off. So here's what we're going to do. Drew's going to play a little bit more, and I'm going to pray. But as, as I'm praying, I want you to think of one word that you're going to be future focused on in this year. You left your burden, you left your past in 2020. This is something you're excited about because there's hope in your future. We get to be future focused because Jesus is still at the end of that race. We're running because we can see Jesus. He's at the end of that race. He's given us a new future. He's given us a new purpose. And that's, that's what we want to get excited about. So as I pray, I want you to think about that one word. And while Drew plays, he's going to play for a few minutes. I want you to come up here. we got some Sharpies. I want you to write one word. It's going to be your future. You've left your past here because of the gospel. It's not here anymore. It's been wiped clean. I want you to find one word that you're excited about. What is your future? What are you excited about in your future? Where do you see Jesus taking you this year? That's what I want you to write here. So let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you've gone before us. You've gone ahead of us. You've run this race before us, God. And while, while you were running this race, you were thinking of us. While, while you were letting your own creation nail you to a piece of wood, you were praying to forgive us. And even through all of that, God, in spite of all of that, you, 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 you did that because of the joy that you knew was on the other side of that. And God, as, as, as we're running our race, as we're trying to figure out the, the, the race that you've set ahead of us, I pray that you would show us what needs to go. Show us what needs to go, but even more so, give us that vision. Where, where do you want us to go? Help us to be excited about the future, God. 2020 was such a hard year. It was hard to be excited about anything, God, but you have set before us a hopeful future. And I just pray that you would show us what, what's that thing we can be hopeful for. Give us hope as we keep running, God, and help us to fix our eyes on you. You're the author and you are the perfecter of our faith, Jesus. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen.